going to return to a message that's found in, uh, or a passage that's found in 2 Kings chapter 6, verses 8 through 23. And the Bible's in front of you. If it's of any help, it's on page 312, 312. So I want to continue the theme that I've done on the previous occasions outside of the last one. Uh, actually, the last one was Peter walking on water. But I want to continue on the theme of God's omnipotence, his mighty power, and his personal interest in each of our lives. If you are part of the study of the attributes of God, I used to teach this in school. It is a phenomenal study to understand the character and the workings of God. I love the omnipotence of God because I grew up thinking that I was really good and smart and powerful and all that stuff and then I really grew up and found out I wasn't. But more than that, it's the personal interest he has in the lives of his people. The previous messages showed personal choice and God's power. Personal choices in God's power. We did that with Daniel. That took him to the lion's den. We did it with Sadrach, Meshach, and Abednego in the fire. And we even did that with Peter walking on water. Their choices, God's power shown to them for protection and provision. Today I want to take another Old Testament character, person, by the name of Elisha. Now I do say to you, I love this story. If you can see me, I'm just smiling. This is funny. This is just, it's one of the funniest stories I think of all of scripture. When we were in Bible college and I've met some of the guys since then, I said, what's your favorite Bible study? And we were just war over sharing it. I know what Pastor Marx is, and he's preached it, and you can just tell. It, it's just a part of his life. This is one that I just, there's just so many lessons to be learned. If you allow me, I want to look at the lives of two more Old Testament characters, possibly three. One is the prophet of God, and the other is the servant. It isn't as much as a message, as much as it is, a recognition of how great God is. So I'm not going to give you like, you ought to do this and you ought to do that and this is the message. It's really just to remind ourselves of how great, how awesome God is. And I want to major on that word. How awesome God is. Have you ever stopped and considered how awesome God is? If not, stop and do it right now. And what would you say my God is an awesome God. There's a part of me that wants to sing that. And I was reminded the morning I really should not do that. But if you know, if I get it right, our God is an awesome God. He reigns in power and might. Da -da 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 -da. And it's repeated over and over and over again. But I confess and proclaim to you, our God is an awesome God. Now, what does that mean? It means exactly what it says. Like our scripture reading this morning in Psalms 42, 46, verse 10. Be still and know that I am God. You and I can witness in the activity of life the awesomeness of God. But you and I well, I am so busy and I'm so taken up with what I do, I don't always see how God's working. Then all of a sudden, it hits you. Whoa, I didn't do that, God did. Oh, God, thank you for providing that. Oh, you made that happen. I was just talking with one of you and you have a job interview this Tuesday. There's nothing that happens that you're going to do or say because if God wants you to have that position, you're going to have that position. That's an awesome God. If he doesn't, okay. That's the way God has laid his plan. Consider Deuteronomy chapter 10, verse 17. For the Lord your God 
is God of gods and Lord of lords, the great God, mighty and awesome, who shows no partiality and accepts no bribes. Verse 21, He is the one you praise. He is your God, who performed for you those great and awesome wonders you saw with your own eyes. So be still and consider the awesomeness of God in our life as a church and in your life as an individual. It will change your spirit. I believe that. It has with me. I know there was a little while ago where things were just getting to me and I were letting them do that. You know how that is? And they were just bothered by it. And I'm, I'm sitting in a chair, which is part of my job. I just sit there and wait for something to happen. And I'm saying, you know, God, this really is not good. It's not exactly what I said, but I didn't curse. I just don't want to use a word in church that my father said I shouldn't use. Now I've got your attention, don't I? It just basically, it, it's what a skunk does after he attacks you. But I said, this really is not good. And I started listing the things that God was doing in my life. Rather than thinking of the circumstances and the problems and everything coming in, I started thinking about what God's done in my life. And I have to tell you, my whole attitude changed. I even talked nicer to the contractors who came to the window. Really. When you do that and you see the awesomeness power of God in your life, you just want to shout it with everybody. It's like going to a retreat, as Houston shared, and the fellowship and the refreshment that he received from that. I want to tell people, do it again. What had God done for the children of Israel? He delivered them in the Passover. He parted the waters. He provided the manna and the quail for food. He provided water when none was available, twice. Throughout Scripture, you see God either protecting or providing for his people. My God is in the details of the personal activities of his children. And at times, the non-believers. You're going to see that in a few minutes. It was true in the lives of the Israelites, the disciples, and the early church. And it's true in your life and my life. Today, God is performing great and awesome wonders in our lives. Some are seen, but many are unseen. Behind the scenes, it is awesome what God is doing. We just have to have the eyesight to see it. And sometimes He doesn't reveal it to us. If He does, we see it. And if we don't, He's still behind the scenes. I want to focus on Elisha and his servant. And you could probably add the king of Aram, who is the king of Syria at this time. Might be another one. Aram is an Old Testament place before Syria, and Assyria took its name. And I want to start with the, the background. The Syrian king had given permission to his top general. If you put it in today's terms, it would be the chief of the joint services of the armed forces. The top guy. This top guy had a problem. You know who he was? He was Syrian. Naaman. That ring a bell for you? He had a problem. He had leprosy. He wanted to get healed. He didn't. Now, by no means, and the passage back in 1 Kings chapter 5 reveals it, he was not a worshiper of Jehovah. He was a worshiper of Ramoth, a Syrian god, which if I remember correctly, is the god of pomegranates. Now that in itself has to be, really, your God is a pomegranate, if I am right. 
your God is this? So he had leprosy, and it's obviously one he can live with, but he wanted to be healed. So very quickly, there was this Israelite servant that was captured and put in Naaman's household for his wife. And she says, well, if you want to get healed, why don't you go to Elisha? He'll heal you. Now, very quickly, he does so. He gets a letter from the king of Amram, or let's just say Ben-Hadad. We'll call him Ben this morning, just for the ease of memory. Gets a letter. He goes to the king of Israel. He gets all upset. He thinks it's a trick. You're just here like he can't see the leprosy. And he gives the letter. He says, I'm looking for Elisha. And he goes to Elisha finally. The king is a little bit nervous. He contacts Elisha. He says, send him over. Send him to my office. Dr. Elisha is available. So, Naaman goes. And what does he do? Elijah gives him, Elisha gives him directions through his servant. Now here you've got this general of this great army and he's not even coming out to him. And he sends the message, go dunk yourself in muddy waters seven times. Huh. He gets indignant about it. Number one, it's not what he thought he should do to be cured of leprosy. Number two, he's probably annoyed that he's being treated without respect. So he refuses to get muddied. If a doctor gave you a prescription to say, take this pill, would you take it? Go, nope, pill's too big. Or the pill looks too, I, I'm not going to do it, doctor. And there are doctors that I am sure that write prescriptions and people don't fill them. It's like they don't want to be healed. So finally, he gets the courage. He says, what do you got to lose? Go do it. He gets healed. And then all of a sudden, Jehovah God is a great God. Greater than his Syrian God. Now, that's in the life of an unsaved individual. He's a non-believer. That's how God. God will work in their lives as well. As you go to the beginning of this chapter, you'll find there's an axe head that came off its handle. And it was borrowed. And if you've been listening to Mark's message, you find that then when you borrow something and it's lost, you're in trouble. It's of great value. And last I heard, axe heads don't swim. So if you look over the first, uh, what is it, the first seven verses, this axe head goes into the water. Is that too small for God? Nope. Elisha comes along, picks up the stick, puts it in the water, and the axe head floats. You have never seen an axe head float. I have not either. God works in the unsaved. God works in the small matters over an axe head. My awesome performing God takes the big and takes the small. So where do we go from there? We get into the passage. There's this conflict between the king of Israel and Ben. And what's happening is that Ben is sending his soldiers to lay in wait. If you look at verses 8, 9, and 10, he is setting these traps for the Israelites to come walking. Uh, just a quick word, and I should have done it ahead of time. Gino, when you took your trip to Israel, how many have taken a trip to Israel besides the Merleys? Did you go to Dothan? It's a hilly country, isn't it? With some valleys in it? Sounds like I was there, but Google has good pictures. Anyway, and you can see that as you go through certain places, they're going in the valleys, where it's an easier place for the armies on top of the hills to capture you. But there's a problem is God doesn't want him to be, them to be captured. So he sends word to Elisha. I don't know how. But Elisha then goes to the king of Israel and says, don't go the way you're going to go. Change your route. Why? 
because the king of Aram wants to capture you. So don't go that way. Okay, we won't go that way. Take a look at it with me. Now, the king of Aram was at war with Israel. After conferring with his officers, he said, I will set up my camp in such and such a place. The man of God sent word to the king of Israel, beware of passing that place because the Aramians are going down there. So the king of Israel checked on the place indicated by the man of God. That's a good idea. Time and again, Elisha warned the king so that he was on guard in such places. Isn't that great? Boy, if I were the head of the Israeli army, I like that. I know the information of what's happening before it takes place. So I can go another route. That is fantastic. <laughs> but this is true of God throughout Scripture. God reveals secrets and hidden things of man. And we've said it before. There are no secrets with God. There are no secrets with God. I'll hit that in a moment. That which we think we hide from others, we also hide from God. Not true. That's why I asked you, how you doing? You said, good. I got to tell you, sometimes on Sunday morning, somebody asks me that question. The answer is, leave me alone. I just want to worship. I'm in pain. I haven't slept. I don't like it. And you come, hi, how are you? <laughs> grit my teeth they're not wrong I am but there are Sundays if somebody were to say how you doing Tom I just want to say terrible there are no secrets God knows I feel terrible who am I hiding from there is nothing concealed that will not be disclosed or hidden that will not be made known and what you have said in the dark will be heard in the daylight and what you have whispered in the ear of the inner rooms will be proclaimed. That's out of Luke chapter 12, verses 1 and 3. 2 and 3, excuse me. All secrets will be revealed. Even Hebrews tells us that nothing is hid from God. Even Nebuchadnezzar realized that in the life of Daniel. Surely your God is the God of gods, the Lord of lords, and revealer of mysteries. For you were able to reveal this mystery. Now, if there are no secrets from God, he is quite easily able to communicate to somebody like the king of Israel not to go to a certain place. But note the other side of it. The king of Aram must be frustrated he must be, my word is ticked. He lays these plans. They're laid with his generals in a secret place. And somebody is a revealer of those plans. He, in other words, would be a whistleblower of what is going on. And you know how our world portrays whistleblowers depending upon what side you're on. So he is not very, had, he is not very happy with this. Verse 11. Verse 11 interests me. It says, This enraged the king of Aram, and he summoned his officers and demanded of them, Tell me, which of us is on the side of the king of Israel? The key there is not that he was enraged. The key there is he demanded. Now, depending upon the version you're in, if you're with me in the ESV, it says troubled. His mind was troubled. How is this happening? What is going here? Somebody's telling a secret. And, of course, his generals know that the penalty for revealing a secret is really... Um, failure. Someone once told me here in the sanctuary, if you want to see God laugh, tell him your plans. 
If you want to see God laugh, tell him your plans. The king, the human, the humanness is, I'm angry. I'm frustrated. And he is frustrated. That's where you get that from the King James and you get it the ESV. I use the NIV. And when you look at that, he's upset because he's demanding of his men who's revealing and who's on the side of the king. Well, let me tell you, God has a plan. And you can't thwart his plans. When you're young, I got all these plans. And I think I can solve that easily. Those of you who went to further education after college, and, or after high school, and you even graduated from college, how many of you wound up in the position that you graduated with on your degree? Not me. One. <laughs> in a special area, that's true. Most of us go in a particular direction, and all of a sudden we go into a secondary one. That's God leading. If somebody told me 50 years ago, it's actually 52 years ago, that I would be a teacher, and I would be a teacher of young people, little people, and I would teach for 42 years, I would say to you, you are crazy. You are absolutely out of your mind. I was the one that got my high school degree and waved as I left. I wasn't even going on for further education. It's like saying, Tom, when did you decide that you could preach? I didn't. I had speech impediments when I was young. So, and I shared that with you before. And to get in front of people? <laughs> terrible. Made me sick to my stomach. So here I am. Now who's laughing? I think God's smiling. He says, I told you I had a plan for your life. And it has been great. I would choose not to. God said otherwise. And they ascribe in verse 12, None of us, my Lord the King, said one of us all. But Elisha the prophet who is in Israel tells the King of Israel the very words you speak in your bedroom. Now, where's Tom going with this one? Let's just say that the most secret place I can think of is your bedroom. And the things you think and the things you say in your bedroom. Now, do be mindful. This is a big bedroom. He met with all of his generals and all that. It's not like our bedrooms. Our is a small one. Yours may be bigger, but we're not fitting a party in our bedroom. And these guys are. And they go, we're, we're not against you. Elisha's at fault. Elisha gets blamed for, you're going to find in chapter 7, even the king of Israel blames him for famine. So he gets blamed. Tell you what, fellow believers, you're on God's side, God's on your side, you're going to get blamed. It's your fault that this is happening. That's not true. It really is just a matter of following what God wants. Um, so the king, uh, I don't want to use that. So the king sends his army. Verse 13, go find out where he is, the king ordered, so I can send men and capture him. Notice, so I can send men and capture him. Anybody get that? You with me with that? He's been thwarted many times when he sent his army. And Elisha told him. Now he's going to send a small force to capture Elisha. Like Elisha doesn't know he's coming? That's human thinking. It doesn't make sense. You failed once, you failed twice, you failed the third time. Maybe you ought to try something different. And it's not sending an army. It's not sending the Delta Force. It's not sending SEAL Team 6. They're not going to do any good. Why? Because Elisha has more on his side than you've got in your army, no matter how well trained they are. So they go in the secret of night, 
so that no one who is revealing all their, excuse me, they go in the secret of night to the one who is revealing all their secrets. I want to say this this morning. In a lot of what we hear within our world, it doesn't make sense. People say it and it's supposed to be true. But when you look at it carefully, it just doesn't make sense, especially if it excludes God. So they keep doing the same thing wrong all the time and saying this is going to happen and this is going to happen. I'm very aware of the words maybe or this is should be. I'm the expert. Then why are you saying a probability rather than a definite? Christians don't do that. We've got the definite, folks. So they send the troops. They're going to capture him. I don't know why. Betty asked me if I was going to tell you this story, so I will very quickly. Betty and I were in a car going someplace, and we drove up, and I think we came to a red light, and we had to sit there, and there was a psychic place off on the side. And she turned to me in our simple conversation. She says, well, it's a shame they have to sit there all day and wait for somebody to come. And I turned to her and I said, if they're a good psychic, they're going to know that. Elisha knows he's coming. Elisha doesn't panic. Throughout Elisha's life, who asked for double the portion from Elijah, he knows that God is on his side. Well, the morning comes, the servant goes out, he looks up in the mountains, and there are the Syrians surrounding Dothan on the hills. Right now there's one of him and there's all this army. What would you do? Well, I'd go get Elisha. And that's what he did. He goes and he gets Elisha and Elisha comes out and he goes, yep, there they are. This is a Horton and Tread translation. You don't see it in your Bible. He comes out. He doesn't panic. He doesn't fear. The servant does. He says, yep. And the servant turns around. Oh, my Lord, verse 15, what shall we do? <laughs> I like that. What should we do? Well, go ahead, servant. Do what you like. No. He turns around because with God, he not only knows the secrets, and this is just comical, he gives strength and he gives safety. And Elisha has learned to trust in that. Like the servant, I think we're prone to look at the circumstances. Whoa, look at that army. Oh, all of a sudden, I don't want to be your servant. For God did not give us the spirit of timidity, but a spirit of power, of love, and of self-discipline. Think about the number of times that Scripture tells us not to be afraid. If you take it in the King James Version, it tells you 63 times. I think it's about a perspective that we have. If your eyes are fixed on God, if your eyes are fixed on Jesus, then there is power not timidity um, so in verse 16 he turns and he says don't be afraid the prophet answered those I've got these in bold letterings so you might want to underline them but not the pew bibles those who are with us are more than those who are with them that's not the answer the servant wanted to hear because he's looking and he can't see them what is his problem here's the crux of the message here it is. Ready? Because he was blind. All he saw were the Syrians around. He didn't see God's provision. He didn't see God's protection. There are times when you and I are probably so busy that we do not see what God's doing. Be still and know that I am God. Sit down. What did God do for you today? What did he do for you yesterday? How is he working in your life? And I guarantee you, 
that joy will be on your lips and a testimony from the heart out of your experience. But sometimes we're blind. He is spiritually blind to God's provision, not physically blind. So it's a matter of what you're looking at. 1989, I saved daily bread. <laughs> I don't know if you do too, but I do. 1989, a woman named Ruth Knowlton told how she came to see the truth. The truth about her judgment about the flaws in her neighbor's window because it was dirty. And she became critical of her neighbor. The building across the alley was only a few feet away and she could easily look into her neighbor's apartment. Ruth had never met the women who lived there, but she could see her as she sewed and read each afternoon. After several months, she noticed the figure by the window had become indistinct. She couldn't understand why the woman didn't wash her windows. One sunny day, Ruth decided to do some house cleaning, including wash her own windows. Later in the day, she sat down to rest by the window. To her amazement, she could clearly and distinctly see her neighbor by sitting in a window. Ruth said to herself, well, finally she washed her windows. No. Take the beam out of your own eye before you take the pole out of somebody else's eye. It was her windows that were dirty. Oh, can't be. Just can't. So, you know, it depends upon a perspective. If your eyes are fixed on Jesus, um, there's no fear. Without spiritual eyes, we see the enemy, the difficulty, the failure, and the defeat. Now, it's all right to get nervous. When we go into a difficult situation, we could get nervous. But remember, God has it already planned. With spiritual eyes, we see God's safety and strength. So what is it we have to do? All the servant needed to do was have his eyes open. So Elijah prayed, O oh Lord, open his eyes so he may see. Then the Lord opened the servant's eyes and he looked and saw the hills full of horses, chariots of fire all around Elisha. Oh, wow. There's the Syrian army. Ah, oh, look higher. Keep looking high. There's God's army, and they outnumber the Assyrians. I bet the servant changed his attitude. Come on, let's go get them. Don't, they'll come to us. Watch this. It is a matter of seeing and looking, and sometimes we need our spiritual eyes, not our human eyes. This last part I call God's grace. As he, verse 18, as the enemy came down towards him, and I like that part. It's like um, walking on water, and it happens throughout a number of times within Scripture, especially in the Old Testament when they are carrying the ark into the water to go across to the other side. Many times the water never parted until they got into the water. You've got to get into the water, froggy. You gotta be there till the waters part and God will deliver you. If you understand my dumb illustration of a frog. If water's hot, it stays. Uh, excuse me, if it's, it jumps out. If you do it slowly, it's deceived. So, Elisha prayed, Lord, strike these people with blindness. So, God answered his prayer. They're coming down the hill and all of a sudden they're blind and can't see. I think there's a great sense of humor here. The servant could have see, open his eyes. You can see, blind. And they can no longer see Elisha. They can't see Dothan. So God did as Elisha had asked. Now what does he do? Well, what would you do with a Syrian army that's now blind walking towards you? He does what God's people should do and what we do many times. You ready? Kill them. 
No. He does not. Oh, come on. They were coming here to kill. Let's kill them. Send fire from heaven. Even the disciples at one time asked for that. These people are not. Send fire. And so there's this thought. The king of Israel also agreed. Send fire. And Elisha says, no. Verse 22. Strike them. Do not, excuse me, do not kill them. That's man's way. They were after the kill us. We want to kill them. By the way, I jumped over a few verses. Elisha leads them from Dothan to Samaria. Here's, here's the great part of that. Do any of you have any idea how long of a march that was to carry a blind army or to lead a blind army to another city? It's 11 to 12 miles away. And the Syrian army is blind. And he says, come on, follow me. I'll take you to the city of Samaria. He's willing to testify the power of God and teach the Syrian something. Do not kill them. Set food and water before them so that they may eat and drink and then go back to their master. So the king prepared a great feast for them and after they had finished eating and drinking, he sent them away and they returned to their master. Because as soon as they entered into Samaria, Elisha prayed, God opened their eyes. They opened their eyes and here they are in Samaria. This isn't Dothan. This is Samaria. What happened? Hey, let's eat. Let's drink. Leave your weapons here and go back to king of Aram. That's what God's grace does. Bring them water to drink. If my enemy hungers... Give him something to eat. If he is thirsty, give him water to drink. In doing this, you will heap burning coals on his head, and the Lord will reward you. That's what we're about. That's what we should be doing. And that's what we do. Keep in mind this thought. 2 Corinthians 4.4 4 says that the God of this world, and I think it's the only time that phrase is used, the God of this world, do you know who the God of this world is? It's Satan. Not our God of heaven who created the earth and sent Satan to the earth. But in that passage, Paul says, the God of this world has blinded the minds of those who do not believe. It is absolutely a miracle of God when he opens the eyes of people who have been blinded by Satan. And God can drop the scales of blindness spiritually from their eyes. They just need a witness. An action of kindness, like food and water. The giving of the word. I can only tell you what's happened to me. Let me share it with you what does this teach us yes there are no secrets from God I find that to be comforting at times maybe not but for the most part he knows with God there's safety because greater is he that is within you than he that is in the world and if God is for us who can be against us and with God, there is grace and mercy for the prisoners. Jesus has conquered sin and death. Heaven is our hope and expectation and anticipation. Let me close with Romans chapter 8, verses 37 and 39. In all these things, we are more than conquerors through him who loves us. Let me say that again. In all these things, we are more than conquerors through Him who loves us. For I am convinced that neither death nor life, neither angels nor demons, neither the present nor the future, nor any powers, neither height nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus. And with that, folks, I say, we serve we have an awesome God. And in fact, I'd like to ask the gentleman to come forward, and that is what we're going to sing at this particular time.